Welcome to part two of the video series, How Sails Really Work. In this section, we'll be looking at the jib and mainsail, how the two sails interact, what the airflow is doing in terms of propelling the boat, and also healing the boat at different points of sail. We'll start out looking mostly at close hauled simulations, and then towards the end of the presentation, look at downwind points of sail. This first slide shows a velocity contour of a two-dimensional slice through the sails up about a third of the way up the rig. The colorization is based on the speed at which the air is moving. On the outside of the simulation, away from the sails, the air is moving at 15 knots at a 30 degree angle, and so this corresponds to a close hauled simulation. The reddish tints correspond to air which is moving faster than average, and you can see there's two areas with significant acceleration. The fastest air is moving right next to the leading edge of the jib, and there's also an accelerated region between the jib and mainsail in an area commonly called the slot. Air is moving slower than average on the other sides of the sail. This is actually the windward side of both sails and also in the turbulent region behind the sails, those large blue streamlines going downwind. This slide shows exactly the same conditions, 15 knots and at 30 degrees, except instead of showing velocity, we're now looking at pressure. So the blue colored regions are low pressure, and the reddish darker areas are high pressure. If you're focusing on the jib, you can see there's a very strong region of low pressure right near the leading edge. And of course, that's where the high velocity region was also located. This correspondence between high velocity and low pressure, you've probably heard of before as Bernoulli's principle, named after the famous Dutch Swiss mathematician, Daniel Bernoulli. In our case, you can see that the jib has the largest pressure differentials. Its both has low pressure on the side towards the bow, and high pressure on the side towards the stern, so that the jib is being both pulled and pushed towards our destination. There's similar conditions on the mainsail, although the pressure distribution, particularly on the low pressure side, has less of a pressure differential than the jib. So we focus just for a moment on the jib, it's useful to think about how all those pressure differentials add up to generate the complete force of the sail. The little blue arrows represent the individual differentials at each little element of the jib, and you can see the biggest differentials right at the leading edge. The jib, of course, is, is curved, and so as you move down the sail downwind, the arrows get both smaller and change in direction. If you add up all those little contributions all up and down the sail, you end up with the total force generated by the sail, which is depicted by the red line. You notice the line is oriented mostly to the side and a little bit forward. And it's useful to think about this total force as being broken up into two parts. The portion of the force that points directly towards the bow is the forward force that's going to drive the boat forward through the water. In, in addition to that, we have a sideways force, the healing force, which of course is pushing the boat sideways. Those two force components add up to the fo total force generated by the sail. Here we have a three-dimensional view of the same force diagram where the net force generated by the sails is shown as a black arrow. You note that the net force occurs about a third of the way up the rig and is slightly in front of the mast. This force you can imagine as being equivalent to attaching a line about at the first spreader and pulling mostly to the side but somewhat forward. Note that because of that position of the force vector, the net force tends to make the boat round down, not round up. We'll discuss reasons for boats rounding up in strong winds in part three of the presentation. Because the forces acting on the sails are significantly above the water line, we end up with torques. The definition of torque is just force times the distance. 
we look at the sideways healing force and forward force separately, we can think of them as two forces and two equivalent torques. The forward force generated by the sails must be balanced by the boat drag, and that's what determines the speed of the boat. The healing force, which is pushing the boat sideways, has to be counteracted by the forces acting on the keel and rudder, and these determine the leeway angle. We'll talk a lot more about leeway when we talk about VMG in part three of the series. There are also these torques. Because the forward force is above the waterline, when you have more forward force, it tends to push the bow down, and often the first sign that a boat next to you has gotten a puff is that the bow of that boat will go down before the boat accelerates. There's also the healing torque, which is the sideways <coughs> pressure on the boat up on the mast, and that's what determines the boat heel. At this point, let's look at the airflow around the jib and mainsail in more detail. This diagram is again a two-dimensional slice through the sails sailing in a close hauled configuration. The lines represent streamlines. If you imagine releasing little bits of fluff and following their path as they went downwind, these the lines represent the path the little bits of fluff would take as they went around the sails. There's several surprising things going on here. One is that there's a little streamlined eddy right behind the mast. The air is actually circulating in a little circle there coming back towards the mast next to the sail and then returning um, next to the streamlines. This little eddy helps reduce the impact of the mast in, deter in disturbing the airflow around the mainsail. Another interesting anomaly is that there's a very large deflection in the airflow right next to the leading edge of the jib. You see that the airflow is, is changed well before it reaches the jib and before it gets to the leading edge, it's turned almost 90 degrees. You can demonstrate this large change in apparent wind direction next to the jib by just putting a telltale on the end of a boat hook. In these pictures, we're sailing at about 30 degrees apparent wind direction. If you look at the lower picture, the black arrow near the mast is the apparent wind direction shown by the masthead fly. Of course, the, the telltale is pointing at right angles to that. This means the air ahead of the boat has been redirected by the sails in such a way that it's basically lifted from the point of view of the jib, and this gives us a big advantage in terms of generating a big pressure differential right there on the leading edge of the jib. If you try this with your own boat, you'll find out that this very favorable condition is quite fragile. If you go over a small wake or some other boat goes in front of you, it breaks the connection between your sails and the air ahead of you, and this all falls apart. The helmsman then has to fall off, start rebuilding this positive airflow situation, and gradually work his way back into this close hauled configuration. In this diagram will compare a case at the top where we're flying the jib alone versus at the bottom where we add the mainsail to the exact same jib configuration. So looking at the top, on the top left, those are the velocity profiles for the jib alone. And again, we have accelerated air on one side and decelerated air on the other side of the sail. The top middle shows that that results in a small pressure differential, which will indeed drive the boat forward. And looking at the top right, we can see that again, the air in front of the jib is being lifted ahead of the sail, although the effect is fairly slight. Now in the bottom row, we've added the mainsail to the exact same jib. Looking at the velocity on the left, we can see that now there's a much larger velocity gradient, but mostly across the jib. So the mainsail has changed the airflow across the jib in a favorable way. That increased velocity results in an increased pressure differential, shown in the bottom middle. And again, those pressure differentials are largely across the jib. And if you look at the bottom right, the although it's a bit hard to see in this small diagram, 
we have the same situation we looked at before, but there's quite a large change in the direction of the airflow ahead of the jib now that we've added the mainsail. And it's that lift generated by the sails themselves which is largely responsible for this increase in pressure differential across the jib. Now we'll look at the same kind of comparison, except this time we'll start with the mainsail and then add the jib. It's not quite as logical a comparison because if you're sailing with the mainsail alone, you certainly don't want to sheet the mainsail close to the center line or the mainsail will end up stalled. And that is the case in this simulation. If you look at the velocity profile on the top left with the mainsail only, there's this big area of slow swirling air behind the sail representing a stalled configuration. And it still produces a slight pressure differential and you can indeed <coughs> make gradual progress with your boat with well, just a mainsail completely stalled, but I don't recommend it. So let's then add the jib in the bottom row. And you see the presence of the jib changes the air that's running into the mainsail. And this, of course, is the slot um, between the jib and the mainsail. And this essentially shuts down the stalled condition of the mainsail and recreates that favorable situation where we have a large pressure differential across the jib due to the nice combination of a well-trimmed jib and mainsail working together. Sailors aren't the only people to take advantage of airfoils that are in multiple sections. Many aircraft involve two, three, and sometimes even four different sections of their wings to get desirable effects. Here's a simple example of a light plane that has, in effect, a jib ahead of the mainsail. In this case, it's called a leading edge slot. The result is that this plane can generate high amounts of lift at high angles of attack, which is very desirable for taking off and landing in short airstrips. I don't want to give you the impression that you have to have two sails to have an efficient wing. Here's an example of the Wiley Cat 30, which is a cat rig boat and sails extremely well upwind. You'll notice that the single sail is sheeted out substantially away from the center line, much farther away from the center line than a mainsail would be set up in a sloop. And that's of course because there is no jib on this boat. So the mainsail is now the first sail to see the wind, and therefore it's sheeted at an angle very similar to that of a jib on a conventional sloop. Now we'll look at an example of not so ideal sail trim. In this case we're sailing in fairly strong winds. The, the jib is sheeted close to the spreaders, but the boat was heeling too much, so we let out the main sheet to get the boat under control. Now you'll notice that the air flowing past the jib is actually pressurizing the backside of the mainsail leading to a curvature. This is often called backwinding the main. Here's a simulation of that sail configuration showing the velocity profiles. You notice that the jib does have a velocity differential with an accelerated region on towards the bow. But the mainsail now has an interesting situation where it's stalled on the windward side, which is quite unusual. You can see the big curvature in the mainsail caused by the pressurization through the slot. Here's the pressure profile for that same sail configuration. Not too surprising, the backwinded portion of the mainsail has pressure higher towards the jib and lower towards the rest of the hull. In other words, that portion of the sail is pushing the boat backwards. Obviously, this isn't an ideal sail configuration. What we'd really like to do if we had time was to put a reef or two in the mainsail and recreate the well-trimmed jib and mainsail configuration we saw in the earlier simulations. Here's a look at the J32 with two reefs in the mainsail. It's worth noting that the majority of both the jib and mainsail in this configuration do overlap to create that favorable two airfoil situation we saw in the earlier simulations. At this point we're going to switch to looking at three-dimensional simulations. Air, of course, will always try to move from high to low pressure, 
With a three-dimensional simulation, you can see the effect of gaps between the mainsail and jib and the hull of the boat. And these gaps allow part of the air to basically bypass the sails, and this results in vortices. Vortices off the bottom and as well as off the top of the sails. This is the source of the so-called bad air, which all racers are aware of and, of course, which we try to avoid when we're sailing in the proximity of other sailboats. This is a three-dimensional picture of the J-32 viewed from above. The boat is on a port tack with a 30-degree apparent wind. You can imagine the apparent wind coming from the lower left corner of the image. The colorization is based on pressure, where the blue surfaces are low pressure and the uh, reddish images are high pressure. As you can see, the jib is low pressure on the downwind side, which is the part of the force that drives the boat forward and also heals the boat. We can't really see much of the mainsail in this image, but we'll come back to it. This is the same view from above, except now we've added streamlines that show the airflow about a third of the way up the sails. This is very similar to the two-dimensional simulations we looked at before. The colorization of the streamlines is based on velocity. The reddish color are the accelerated, fast-moving air, and the bluish tints are the slower air. And again, the high-speed areas correspond to low-pressure regions on the sail, which help drive us forward. Here is a side view of the same sail configuration, close-hauled on a port tack. The mainsail and the jib are both at elevated pressure. You can see the darkest regions are right up near the leading edge of the jib, but both sails are completely pressurized. And this is a sign of good sail trim. All of the sail surface is working for us. Here's a view from the windward side of the boat. The <coughs> darkest blue corresponds to the lowest pressure, which is right along the leading edge of the jib. But you can see that the entire jib has a nice low pressure region, which is um, very good for driving the boat forward, although it also makes the boat heel. The pressure profile on the mainsail is a bit more complicated because you have the interaction between the jib and the mainsail in the slot area. So the pressure right near the leading edge next to the mast on the mainsail is about neutral uh, and then decreases down to a somewhat decreased pressure on the remainder of the mainsail. But you'll notice that the pressure differential on the mainsail is less than that on the jib. Here's a view from upwind where we can see the streamlines about a third of the way up the sail. At this region the streamlines are relatively parallel to the water and essentially you have pretty well behaved airflow around both sails. Things get a lot more interesting when you look at airflow near the base of the sails. Here there's a gap, so in attempting to move from high to low pressure, some of the air actually bypasses the sails and ends up flowing through the gap. And this results in a vortex which extends a long way downwind from the sailboat. You can also see some turbulence caused by the hull itself. Here's a similar view but at the top of the sails. And again, you can see a vortex centered approximately on the junction between the jib forestay and the mast. And it's interesting that this vortex is rotating in the opposite direction from the vortex that's formed down near the foot of the sails. Here's a closer view of some of the eddies on the downwind side of the hull. And you can see there's all sorts of turbulence associated with air working its way around the hull and dodger. The hull wasn't simulated in great detail here uh, because the focus of these simulations were the sails. If we actually simulated the cockpit area, you'd probably see even more significant eddies springing from that area of the hull. Here we're looking at four different points of sail with the same point of view looking down at the sailboat. It's interesting that <coughs> from a close hull to beam reach configuration, the airflow around the sails is quite similar as long as we properly let out the main and jib as we're moving downwind. Things change rapidly though once you get past a beam reach to a broad reach 
Once you're sailing downwind, the sails end up stalled and end up with large eddies that um, propagate downwind of the sails. Here are the same four cases, but looking from the windward side of the boat. Again, you can see the airflow is reasonably well behaved up until you get to a beam reach. Abaft of a beam reach, you inevitably get stalled sails, which results in a lot of turbulence. We'll talk much more about sailing downwind in part three of these presentations. I should mention that all these simulations assume that a whisker pole is being used to keep the foot of the jib properly positioned relative to the mainsail. Here's a wonderful example of do as I say, not as I do. Here's the J32 headed towards the Golden Gate Bridge on a broad reach and you'll notice that a whisker pole is not deployed on the jib. So the jib is not ideally positioned, it's much too close to the mainsail. What you don't see in the picture is that there are about 10 or 15 other sailboats clustered around the Golden Gate Bridge which this boat is going to have to navigate through. Sailing shorthanded with a whisker pole in those conditions is probably not the best idea. Here's a complicated chart which you can stare at at your leisure. It, the simulations were set up to answer the question, if I could have an infinite sail inventory and could adjust both the mainsail and jib however I wanted, what would give me the best performance at each point of sail? And the answer in general is that you'd like very flat sails for sailing upwind but as the minute you get away from sailing close hauled, you'd like a sail inventory which, with a much fatter cross section. And in terms of trimming the sails, in general, a good first approximation is as we move away from close hauled, if both sails are adjusted evenly, so they both change angles in parallel, that's pretty close to ideal. In real life, we don't have an infinite sail inventory, and as a practical compromise, what people really do is tend to cut their mainsail and jib for sailing close hauled, and then use a spinnaker for sailing downwind. This leaves most boats without ideal sail shapes for sailing at reaches, but most of the time, particularly in racing conditions, you find that you're sailing either close hauled or fairly close to downwind, so the combination of white sails and a spinnaker works almost all the time. One last comment about the flow of airflow around the sails is that when you're sailing close hauled or on a close reach, the airflow is relatively constant and you can basically say that the boat's at steady state. When you're sailing downwind, the sails are stalled and it's quite chaotic. There's eddies breaking off the, uh, both sails and these eddies fluctuate back and forth and ended up putting forces on the sails which change quite quickly. That's part of the reason being a helmsman when you're sailing downwind takes so much attention because the forces really are not constant. Here's an attempt to simulate in slow motion that chaotic airflow. Here we're looking down at the jib on the left and mainsail on the right as we sail on a broad reach and see all the beautiful eddies going back and forth across the sail. Well this concludes part two of the series. In part three we'll be looking at the performance of the hull and addressing issues where both the hull performance and sail performance have to be balanced, such as maximum VMG upwind and downwind.